Statistics. Hypothesis testing T distribution one tail lower where the standard deviation of the population is not known. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. You're not first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section 1984 hypothesis testing T distribution one tail lower STDP not known tab. Looking at a scenario that's similar to recent scenarios, except for this time, we have hypothesis testing instead of confidence interval. We have a one tail lower this time instead of a one tail upper or a two tail distribution where the standard deviation of the population is not known, which is in essence one of the main reasons that we're using a T distribution as opposed to a normal distribution, which we will get into more shortly. But first, we do have similarities in that we're going to be looking at a population that we want to find information about. We can't test every item within that population. So what do we do? We take a sample of the population, test the sample, hoping we can apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population. As we know, there are two main methods for doing this. One being the hypothesis testing, two being the confidence intervals. Confidence intervals lending themselves to situations where we don't have any idea what that middle point is. Therefore, we first take the sample, we test the sample, get the mean, the middle point. That will be the middle point that we will use and then build a confidence interval around it in some way, shape, or form. With the hypothesis testing, however, that's what we're doing this time. We're going to have an idea of what that middle point is or what that middle point should be. And we're gonna build our graph around that hypothesized middle point. And then we will take the sample and we'll get the mean from the sample to see if the results we get from the sample are far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis, the hypothesis testing strategy, therefore looking similar to a United States criminal court case situation where you might have the person in court because somebody at least thinks there might be some guilt involved. That's why they're in the court case. But the presumption, the way we set up the case, is innocent until proven guilty. That would be similar to us using the hypothesized amount that we build the graph around. And then we think about whether we get enough preponderance of evidence in our case the mean of the sample being far enough away for us to determine that the originalized hypothesized amount is incorrect. Now, we also have the idea of are we using normal distributions or T distributions and the concept of one tail upper, one tail lower, or the two tail situation. So normally we think about a normal distribution as the curve that we usually think about this kind of shape of curve as being. But uh, if we don't know the spread of the population, then it's more likely that we might go to the T distributions, which look like a normal distribution, but have wider tails on them and are actually different graphs with varying tail wideness <laughs> that will be based on the degrees of freedom, a calculation needed when using T distributions, but not typically for normal distributions, which is basically based on the sample size minus the number of samples uh, that we take. So, so in our case, we're going to imagine we don't know what the standard deviation of the population is, 
And in particular, if your sample size is fairly small, that's when you would want to be then defaulting to the, uh, the, the T uh, distribution, noting that as your sample size gets larger, the tails of the T distributions are gonna taper off. And even if using the T distributions, it might be more similar to what you would have on a normal distribution with the thinner tails. Also, we have a situation of, are we gonna have a one tail upper, a one tail lower, or a two tail situation? Now remember, if this was a normal distribution as opposed to a T distribution, we often think about like five in the tails as alpha and a two tail scenario as the default, which means that we would build our hypothesis around the middle point, which in terms of standard deviations would basically be, would be zero, right? And then in terms of whatever we're talking about, in our case, we're gonna say time for the process, we're gonna say it's 15.5, we'll say hours, for example, or minutes or whatever the time will be, uh, that's gonna be our middle point in terms of uh, X's. And if it was a normal distribution, remember that around 95% of the information or the area under the curve would be within two standard deviations of that point. Uh, and then that would mean that 5% would be in the tails broken out evenly because of the sy symmetry of the graph, 2.5 on each side. However, if we're looking at a T distribution, that means that it's going to be a little bit wider, more than two standard deviations uh, to, to get that same 95% because these tails have more, inf more data within them. They're fatter, right? So we would have to have a, a wider range in order to get the same 95% in that a middle component, which kind of makes sense if you're thinking about a situation to give you a little bit more confidence, you would need a wider range, which is what happens when you have the fatter tails uh, of the graph. The other thing to consider is in a two-tailed situation, for example, if we're looking at our time, how long does it take uh, to, to process something if we're doing a job uh, how, what's the time frame that it takes to do the job? Let's say it's like 15.5 hours or possibly 15.5 uh, minutes or whatever units that we are uh, doing it in. We might be asking, uh, is that correct on the high end and low end if we're auditing it? And that would be a two-tailed distribution. I want to know if that is the correct middle point and see if it's off on either the high end or the low end. Or... Uh, we might be looking at a situation where we're saying, hey, there's a new process that we want to use. And one of the main factors for us using the new process is that it's faster. So if we're looking at how long does a particular process takes, and it was like, let's say, let's do minutes, 15.5 minutes was the old process. Now we have the new process. What we want to think about is a one tail test. It's only going to be more important to us if it, if we have less time that it takes for us to do it as opposed to a prior example that we looked at where we said how many units can we make within a certain time frame so if we said how many units can we make within a certain time frame and i was looking for a new machine then i would be trying to say i want to make more units right i would do the new process or the new machine if i had more units notice we've kind of switched the units and the time here so now we're looking at a process and we want it to take less time to do the same process. So the idea here would be, I think the new process will be better and will take less time. That's why I'm considering it in a similar way as that's why someone might be in a court case become someone assumes they're guilty of some kind of crime. But I'm gonna set up my situation in a similar way as that court case, assuming it takes the same amount of time as the prior process, then do my sample testing. And only when I have a preponderance of evidence that it's going to be out here somewhere in the one tail to the left, am I going to make the determination that it's going to be a take less time rejecting the, the original hypothesis. All right, that's the idea. Let's erase this stuff. And we're going to go back to the start. Go back to the start. Boom. All right. Oh, man. I went back and then it bounced back on me.
Okay, so we're gonna say this is gonna be a hypothesis testing T distribution. We're gonna say how, how long does it take? Let's stay with minutes here. I keep on bouncing. I should put units of time in here would be uh, useful. Uh, but uh, so time for a process. Let's say it takes 15.5 minutes to do something. Standard deviation is not known. Therefore, we're gonna be using T distributions, wider tails, as opposed to the normal distributions. Most of the calculations will be much the same. However, we'll see that more shortly. The company, does, does new process take less time? This is the perspective. We're the company, we have a new process being proposed. Question being, is it faster? That's the key component as to the argument as to why we would do the new process. Remembering that might not be the only reason you do a new process. Maybe it, it's gonna cut down on errors, the new process. You have more internal controls, more checks and balances or something like that. All of those can be taken into consideration, but remember that hypothesis testing is an attempt to get a scientific process happening. So we can only really test one thing at a time, right? So if, I, if I'm trying to do a new process, I have to test one thing, is it faster? And then I might test another thing, is it reducing the error rate? I can't really test those two things at the same time, just like I can't really test something in a lab. The reason I take it into a lab to test it is so I can remove all other factors looking only at one factor at a time. That's what we're trying to basically do most of the time with a scientific process. The null hypothesis is that we assume it takes the same amount of time. We're hoping it's not true, but that's the assumption we start with. The alternative hypothesis, H sub A, would be that the conclusion, if the null hypothesis is rejected, that would be that the new process is faster. What if the new process is substantially slower? We don't really care if it's slower because the null hypothesis is that it takes the same amount of time or more time because it's a one-tailed test, we only care if it's faster. All right, so then we're gonna say that this is gonna be our graph of the data. We're gonna be picking up our data with our information. This is the behind the scenes information, which I'm imagining we don't know in universe, but we're gonna make a large population and draw from the population so that we have the actual information of the entire population and then the information of the sample so we get a better idea of the sample as it relates to the entire population. In practice, of course, we would only be able to test so many times. In theory, you can imagine, well, what if I tested it like an infinite amount of times, right? If I'm testing a new process, the question is, if I tested it like forever, however many times I'm gonna do it, what's, what's gonna be the, the time that it takes like on average? So obviously we'd have to sample it to do that, but I'm gonna give a large amount of test times, which will approximate that infinite amount of times that we draw from. So we have an idea of the actual population versus the data that we're getting. In Excel, we do this problem in Excel in another course or section. That's of course a much longer lecture with possibly less explanation, more uh, Excel practice but you can check that out. We're gonna just touch on some of the things you might do to simulate this in Excel so that you get an idea of the process. We can use the data analysis, which you'd have to turn on in Excel if you wanted to turn it on, which you could find, look it up, chat GTP possibly or some other source. We're gonna do a random number generation, but the random numbers are gonna be designed around, uh, around the normal distribution of 15.5 as the middle point and the standard deviation of 4.5. And that spit out these numbers. So this is gonna be the amount of time we're, we're imagining the whole population of sample tests took, which we, we're gonna imagine the population is, we did it like 500 times to get a population that we will then be drawing from. If I then plot this out, notice it makes a nice somewhat bell curve, remembering that if I don't know the standard deviation of the population. And if I have a small sample size, it might be the case that the, that the, the, the central limit theorem isn't gonna kick in enough for us to take something that wasn't normally distributed. Perhaps it had like a uniform or skewed, a very skewed left or skewed right distribution. If we knew the standard deviation of the population because we typically test based on the concept of 
all of the combinations of samples, the mean of all the combinations of samples, we could still use the concept of the bell curve because the central limit theorem will kick in. But if our sample size is small and we don't know the standard deviation, then we're hoping that the actual population data somewhat approximates a bell-shaped curve. That will make it more accurate uh, because we'll still have that bell shape even though the central limit theorem may not have kicked in. When you're talking about something like how long does a process take, you would expect it to have a bell-shaped type of distribution because that's the type of data that typically would, right? How long does it take to do a repetitive task? Usually you're gonna have a middle point and some kind of distribution around that middle point, right? So then if I was to take the, the calculation of N, the population, just counting this population, it comes out to 500. And then if I take the mean of this uh, numbers, comes out something similar to what we based it around, but not exact, 15.41. So that's what we're gonna say the mean of the population is, which is not known in universe. We have the standard deviation of the population of these numbers, 4.72, which is somewhat close to the 4.5, but again, somewhat different because it was a randomly generated numbers around a center point. All right, so then we have the question of taking the sample. Now in real life, of course, we would have to test this. We would test it multiple times, put on the old stopwatch and, uh, and, and do our testing. And, but uh, here we're gonna take these numbers from the population. How could we do that? Well, we could say however many we want in the sample, in our case, it's 50. 50 actually being a fairly large sample size, uh, you know, uh, so it should help us to generate our bell-shaped curve. Uh, meaning when you have the T distributions, we have different graphs for the T distributions with fatter tails for smaller sample sizes and, and degrees of freedom uh, have to be taken into consideration. But when you get a, a higher sample up to 50, you get a, you get a T distribution that gets closer to the skinny tails of the normal distribution. So in any case, <clears throat> we could just take the top 50 because these were randomly generated. We could put a random number generation next to it and then shuffle both columns like a deck of cards. Or we can do an index function, which is what we do here, which we take the index of this column, that's what this range is, and do a random number generation, meaning tell an Excel, give me a random number of numbers between row one and row 500 because there's 500 rows and we get this sample. So this sample represents what we know in universe, 50 tests of the process that used to take 15.5 minutes each under the old system, but now we ex we're trying to see if it's faster or not. So then we can say, we can rephrase our hypothesis with symbology now. So H sub zero, H naught sometimes called, is the hypothesis that mu, mu representing the mean of the population, the middle point, is greater than or equal to 15.5. Why greater than or equal to? Because the hypothesis is that the new process takes the same time, 15.5, of the old process or more. If it takes more time, we're still is gonna say we're gonna reject it because it's a one tail test which means that the H sub A, which is the alternative hypothesis of mu, the mean, is going to be less than 15.5. In other words, if it's substantially less than 15.5, then we reject the null hypothesis, we accept the alternative, and we have an argument with data to back up support the idea of going to the new process versus the old process. Might not be the only factor, Maybe the new process has more errors in it. Maybe there's other things, problems with the new process, but we, we can only test one thing at a time. This is one thing in the new process's favor if we can say that it's faster. All right, so we're gonna say then that, that the N, the sample size is 50, meaning if I did a count of these numbers, we took 50 tests. We ran 50 tests of the new process with our stopwatch. Degrees of freedom, 
This is something that you need when doing t-testing, but not when the normal distribution, because this is going to help us determine what graph, what t-graph we're going to use, which you used to have to look up in a textbook, but now Excel picks the proper graph. However, we need to understand that the graphs have different varying degrees of thickness of the tails, which is dependent upon the degrees of freedom, which 50 is dependent upon in part the sample size minus the number of samples. In this case, we only took one sample. So 50 minus one is 49. Uh, and, and also note that if your sample size is above 50, if it gets to like 100, then you're getting you're getting a, a distribution that again has fairly skinny tails that's going to tend towards more like a normal distribution. X bar, that's going to be the sample of the mean. Remembering that the idea here is that we have the the population data, which we don't know, but we have the mean of the population. We have the mean of the sample, which is what we're going to be using, which should tend towards the mean of the population. But the actual graph that we're going to be building here is based on the concept of the mean of all combinations of samples of whatever sample size that we have, right? All three of those means hopefully will tend towards the mean of the uh, the mean of the population. It's it's with the standard deviation where, where the spread that that becomes more significant, which we'll talk about shortly. We're going to pick an alpha of 0.05, remembering that we have to be careful with a one tail test because usually when we think about 0.05, we think about like a two tail test where 95% of the data would be in the middle. And then you'd have 0.05 in the two tails, which would be uh, 2.5 in each tail. If I pick an alpha of 5%, which is somewhat generically picked, but it's a common number to pick in a one tail test, then all 5% is in this one tail. It's not split between two tails, right? So we have to just keep that in mind. That means, well, we'll keep that in mind. So then we're going to have then the standard deviation of the sample, which is this calculation, stdev uh, dot s of the sample numbers, which are going to be these numbers. Remembering that we don't know the standard deviation of the population in universe. We are iman imagining. We know it from behind the scenes at 4.72. We took the standard deviation here of the sample, 4.18 which should be somewhat close to the population, but you can see it's still significantly, uh, somewhat significantly different. And, and so that's why one of the reasons why we're using a T distribution instead of a normal distribution to have that, that leeway of the, of the wider uh, tails within it. But the standard deviation of the sample or the population is not what we use to build the graph. Remembering the graph is built on two things. It's built knowing the middle point, the mean, the standard deviation, and in terms of the t-distribution, which graph are we going to use? Uh, the standard deviation is, is actually the standard deviation as though we're thinking about the mean of all combinations of sample sizes of whatever sample size we choose, in this case, 50. So we do that actually with a formula. But this number will be used in the formula to calculate that, that standard error calculation, which is the standard deviation that we use in the sample. If we knew what the standard deviation of the population was, we would use that number. So here it is, the standard deviation or the standard error. Let's see if I pull the formula over. It's this formula. So it's gonna be, I'm, we're not gonna use the, the second, the correction factor. So it would be the standard deviation of the population if we knew that, but we don't. Therefore, we're going to substitute the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n, which is the sample size. So if I plug that, if I was to plug that into the formula over here, to, to, where am I? It would be it would be the standard deviation of the sample, 4.18, divided by the square root of the sample size, 50. Here's a little formula here. And so that's the standard error. And then the t-test. So notice the test statistics. So remember what we got, we built the graph around the hypothesized amount 15.5, which is the time it took for the old process. 
We then tested the new process and it actually came out in this case to a higher number. That's not good. I can already see that that's not good, right? Because it's supposed to be faster, but we came out to 16.09. So, so now I can compare this number to that number. So what am I doing when I do that? If I go back on over here, remember the middle point of the graph was based on the hypothesized number 15.5. And now we're taking what we actually got from the sample, which is going to be somewhat away from that. It's actually on the right of that. And then, and then I can compare that to calculate the Z score, which is now called the T score, which is measuring in standard deviations. So notice I have two X, two X values down here. One X value is the time is the minutes it takes. Uh, and the other is in terms of what we used to call Z scores, which are now the T score which are in essence, the standard deviations. All right, so we're gonna go back on over and say, I can calculate that by just taking my middle point that we calculated 16.09 minus the middle point over here for the hypothesized value 15.5. We get the uh, 0.59. We divide that by the standard deviation, not of the population, not of the sample, but the standard error, that's the standard deviation we use to make the graph. So divided by the point, uh, whoops, wait a sec. No, that's right, 0 0.59114, 114, okay. We get about 993, 9938. I think it's different because of rounding. I might've miskeyed it, but I think, let me do it one more time. <laughs> We've get the 1609 uh, minus the 15.5. Those are, have rounding involved divided by the 0.59114. So about, oh my goodness, that's even worse. 16.09 minus 15.5 is that divided by the 0.59114, boom. All right, 9938 about. So it's different because of rounding, I believe. All right, also I, I shuffle, like when I do this in Excel, I actually make it so I, these numbers shuffle around so I tried to copy everything over so it didn't shuffle around or change the numbers, but just keep that in mind as well. In any case, we've got that. And so that's gonna give us, that's the formula, that's the test statistic. So then based on that, we can calculate the p-value uh, for the test statistic. All right, what is that? If we look at our graph over here, we're looking at, at the p-value. So we're gonna be, now remember if we had the one tail on this side, the area of the graph we set to be at the 0.05. And then if our test statistic was was like close to it over here, let's say if it, if it was like back here, then I would have an area from, from that point onwards that would be greater than the orange area. Our amount is way over here, right? It's actually on the right-hand side. So that means the area from left to right that we have is gonna be much greater than, than the area of the little orange area, which would indicate that we would not reject, right? So that's gonna be the idea. How do I calculate that? We're gonna calculate that with the formula here. In Excel, it would be t.dist, and then we would pick up the x, which is a little confusing because it's gonna be the t here. And then we would be picking up the uh, degrees of freedom, which would be not the sample size, but the sample size minus the number of samples, in our case one, which would be the 49, and then it would be cumulative indicated by this one, which comes out to 0 0.8379, uh, so like 83% under the graph, which is of course vastly uh, greater than the alpha, which means that it does not look at all like this process is faster, which we can already see because it was, it was higher, it took more time than the other process and therefore, uh, uh, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis that it takes the same amount of time as the prior process or more. Now, I could do this with the Z test just to compare it. Imagine I'm not using the T's, but the Z's, which have a skinnier tail, norm.s.dist uh, is going to be taking uh, the, the, the Z, which is now going to be the uh, 0.99. Uh, three, eight, and then see if it's going to be cumulative. It is, and you get to a number that's slightly, uh, slightly different, given the fact that you're talking now with a Z distribution, the graph that has slightly different tail widths. All right, the other way we can look at this is with the, is with the critical value. 
Now with the critical value, what we want to do is say, okay, well, here's my, here's my graph. This is the critical value, which I would have to clear. I'd have to be on this side of it in order I've been the left hand side because it's a it's a left tail test right I'd have to be on the left side for us to reject the null so let's take a look at that what would that look like to calculate it we've got the t dot inverse of uh, the probability and we're picking up the probability then of the 0.05 because that's the 0.05 the orange area under the curve the 5% on the left hand side measuring from left to right and then comma degrees of freedom, which again is going to be the 49. That gives us the 1.6766. So notice that would be this point. So down here, 1.67 about in T's, which are equivalent to Z's instead of in terms of times or minutes. And then if I did that same thing for the Z score, we come out to, it would be a norm dot S dot inverse of the probability of once again 0.05 and that would give us a slightly different number 1.6449 so notice if i look at, at these graphs i graphed both of them out this time it's we have the same axes down here but the graph up here for the t is a little fatter on the tail which means that once i when i graph it down i get a little a slightly different number it's it's, it's very uh minimal in this case so this would be the t distribution then i graph the z down with the normal distribution below it all right let's go now and graph these out so if i graph these out i'm going to go with a t from zero so i'm going to first think about how wide does this thing need to be in t's recalling that if it was a normal distribution, you'd have 95% of the data within two standard deviations. Most of the data would, would be within four standard deviations. Although the T distribution has wider tails, still most of the data will be within four standard deviations. So I just chose four and then 399, 398 and so on. Converted it to X's. How would I convert it to an X? The T's can be converted to X's, which are minutes instead of measuring in standard deviations by taking the standard error 0.59114 times four in this case, because there's four of them times four. And then I'm going to say minus the middle point, which is the hypothesized amount 15.5. And that gives us to the 13.14 about. So we did, so I do that all the way down. That gives us our X's. And then I could take my P of X, which is calculated as T dot dist of X, which is actually the T, the four degrees of freedom, which was the 49 and then zero because it's not cumulative this time that gives our P of X. And then I graph the little orange part on the end of the graph for everything that is less than 1.68, that 1.68 being the factor here rounded up 1.68 for the critical value so i told excel then a logic function if this number right there the four is less than that 1.68 or less than this number then the critical value then i want you to give me the percent if not then leave it blank and it gave me the percent for all these ones. And then if I kept going down, it would leave them blank because I'm only seeing the, the top part of the graph that has the, the, the ones where they've been included, the orange bit. So the orange bit was laid on top then of the blue bit. And so there's our graph in terms of T distributions. I did the same thing in comparison, just so you can see the Z's, which would be similar. So I took the Z's are the same here measured in Z's rather than T's which are the are the standard error calculation uh, uh, and then and then X's I, I did the same calculation for the X's so the, the the Z the T's are and the Z's are the same the X's are the same but then the P of X is now calculated with this formula norm dot dist of X this time I'm taking the X instead of the Z or the T and I'm taking the mean which is the middle point of the graph in time, 15.5 for the hypothesized value. Uh, 
and then the standard deviation, which is the standard error, this number, and then we took, is it cumulative? We're gonna say no, and that gives us these numbers. So, so this is what's gonna change, right? The, 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 the percent based on the fact that we're using a graph over here, which once again has smaller tails versus the T distribution with larger tails, which is known by the system by these formulas. Everything else is basically the same. The T's are the same, the X is the same. And then I said, give me the numbers. If this Z is less than 1.64, which is the critical value we came up with for the, the Z calculation. And so we have that. And that gave me this graph, which looks very similar, but slightly different in terms of, in terms of uh, the, the, the graph being, again, a little bit, it's hard, you can't even really see it right here, but it would be a little bit of a thinner tails on the graph here. So if we analyze this, once again, we say the middle point of the graph is going to be in terms of standard deviations or T's, it's at zero. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the time, it's at 15.5, 15, 15.5. 15, 15 and then we calculated the critical value over here, which boom, boom, it's at 1.66 about, I think it was like 1.67. That's the amount we would have to clear 1.67 about, which converts to a time of about 14.52 uh, minutes, we're saying. Uh, and, and then we said that our number came out to be 16.09, 16.09, which is way over here, somewhere like over here somewhere. So the area of, of all this, right, do, all this all the way through is obviously going to be much greater than than the area there it's like 83 percent versus five percent which means of course we're not going to reject the null hypothesis because it actually takes longer to do the new process it's not faster at all again there might be other factors involved in our uh, decision making process uh, if we looked at the z analysis we still have this just to note we still have the center point which is at, at zero and the same uh, related X. Uh, but if we look at the critical value, uh, the critical value is now at, at 1.64 rather than 1.67, which is, you can't really even tell that one point, it's still pretty close over here. So it's almost looks 1.64, it should be on, the, on there. And so it looks quite similar. And then we said that our value would, that what we got was this was the same 16.09 and the the p value of the 16.09 would be 8 uh 839 versus 837 so again pretty small difference meaning we have the same amount that we got which was 16 1609 1609 and so the area of like all of this comes out to be pretty close to the area of all this. It's only different by 0.37 versus 0.83.837 versus 0.839. And and in part that might be in part due to the fact that we had a fairly large uh, sample, relatively large sample compared to our prior practice problem, which means the T distribution graph that we used was actually a lot, is, is a lot closer to the normal distribution with the skinnier tails than what we would have had if we had a sample size that was around like 12 or something uh, like that, right? So, so you're getting less of a difference between what you would get from a normal distribution and a T distribution, or, or at least that's one reason you'd get less of a difference uh, between the two. Also, well, there it is. We'll leave it at that.